South Africans need to brace themselves, especially those in the economic hub of Johannesburg in Gauteng, for a looming water shutdown that could last at least six months. Now, the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, which supplies 60% of Gauteng's water demand and irrigation water for commercial farms, is scheduled for shutdown on October the 20, uh, or well, this October 2024, until I think it's March 2025. Water scarcity became a reality last month when Johannesburg was left without water for almost two weeks after a breakdown. Randwater, which supplies three Gauteng metros in Johannesburg, Twane and Kuruleni, pleaded with residents to reduce their water consumption. A report published last year by the National Department of Water and Sanitation painted a very grim picture of the country's water resources and water infrastructure. To discuss the future of water here in South Africa, we are joined in studio by the founder and group managing director of BT Industrial, Homozo Lekola. And virtually, we are joined by associate professor and water management expert at UNISA, Professor Anya Duplessis, and water expert from the University of the Free State Center for Environmental Management, Dr. Anthony Turton. So, those are the guests that we have with us. We're so happy to have us to have them with us. But Randwater, we did invite them. They unfortunately declined the invitation. Um, we wanted them to be with us um, because they, they say they are able to supply water to municipal customers and localized water challenges should be directed to various municipalities. That was their response to us after we invited them to participate in the discussion. So unfortunately, no voice from them in this particular one, but invitation still stands and uh, we're happy to have them here on the program so again to my guests welcome thank you very much for your time um, dr. Turton I want to start off with you talk to me about the situation but obviously I, I began by focusing in on on Gauteng and the issues we have here but the whole morning we've gone from the Eastern Cape to the Free State to the Northwest the same story if not worse, in different parts of the country. Perhaps you want to maybe give us an understanding as to where we are at with water and is it the next big problem facing South Africa? Yes, um, good morning to you and the listeners. Uh, I get asked that question a lot. Uh, is water a looming crisis? I think we are deep in that crisis. We must stop talking about is it going to be. We are far in that crisis already. And the crisis is actually, strangely enough, not about the water scarcity issue. Water scarcity is simply about the, about the non-availability of the resource uh, somewhere in the system. In this context, we do have water in the system. And in fact, over the last couple of years, the Vol River system has been the fullest I've, I've known of it to be for, for many, many uh, decades. So it's not a question of that we don't have water. The problem that we have is the fact that our institutions for the management of water have failed uh, and there are many examples of how those institutions have failed. And because those institutions have failed, they are unable to respond uh, in time. They are unable to fix what's broken. They are unable to get it back ahead of the curve. So institutional failure, in my professional opinion, is, 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 is probably the root cause of uh, our problems. And the second uh, uh, issue that comes from the uh, institutional failure aspect is our, our water quality crisis. Uh, we have a national water quality crisis of absolute monumental proportion. Uh, this is hardly ever spoken about. People only speak about, uh, about non-availability of water. But the water crisis, uh, the, the, the water quality crisis, uh, in my view, is driven mostly by the collapse of our wastewater treatment works. Because you must remember that uh, the South African economy is, is engineered on an assumption that we recycle all of our wastewater back into drinking water, but people don't want to uh, drink water, uh, uh, sewage water no, directly as potable water, so it goes back into the river uh, from which it is then abstracted again. Uh, so it's kind of like a sleight of hand, uh, like a trick that's played, that it's water from the river, not water from a wastewater works. Yeah. And that is why our Green Drop report is so incredibly important. We cannot have anything less than 100% than compliance on Green Drop because if we don't have, have full compliance on green drop, then the blue drop uh, uh, quality starts dropping because we simply cannot uh, uh, treat uh, a water that is sewage contaminated. Yeah. And we, you know, the, the situation is so bad now that the, that the, the Vile River system and the, the Orange River system is now becoming saline, increasingly saline. And uh, we're starting to see for the first time 
different species of, uh, of, of blue-green algae that are starting to emerge. Uh, they've been uh, identified a couple of years ago already. But these species are different to the current blue-green blue algae that we have, and they've got uh, all sorts of capabilities that we, we don't yet fully understand. So, so, in other words, we are really going into an area now where our technical and scientific knowledge is starting to become a limiting factor because we don't know what it is that we need to know. Okay. All right. A, a, a good a, a opening point, and, 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 and I'm going to bring you into the conversation, Professor Duplessis, as well. Um, and picking up on, not to repeat what um, uh, Dr. Turton has said, but perhaps to, to add any points to that, and maybe the starting point, and, and I want to see if you agree that this is not uh, a crisis that's coming. We are in the middle of a crisis right now. Do you agree with that sentiment? I unfortunately agree. We can't dance around this issue anymore. Um, we have to recognize that it is a crisis. Obviously, the magnitude and the types of crises differ across the country. So, as, I, as uh, Prof. Turton said, that um, in Joburg, we don't have a water scarcity problem. It's more the failure of water infrastructure, where almost half of our treated water is uh, actually just being lost through leaks, and that obviously then affects your revenue, um, and municipalities at the end of the day can't uh, pay rent water for the, for the water they are given. Um, in terms of water quality, I did research about this for the past 20 years. There is a clear decline, and as we've seen with the outbreak in water lettuce, and also I think water hyacinths won't be uh, too far behind, is that most of our rivers have actually now lost their buffering capacity. What is concerning is, for the past three years, we've actually received below average rainfall. So that means that actually your, your pollutants are actually being diluted. But as we move into a, a more normal rainfall cycle, we unfortunately might see, and most probably will see, you know, um, larger water quality problems like Prof. Turton said, um, cyanobacteria, algal blooms, uh, more alien invasive species. Um, and then at the end of the day, you need to also consider that water quality plays a role in your water availability as well. Mm -hmm. So you can have water, but if it's not of a suitable quality, you won't be able to use it, let's say, for irrigation. Uh, industries might um, have to treat, the, treat it before it's used. So that's another issue. But the primary issue that I think that we need to focus on first is to say that we acknowledge that this is a crisis and um, stop tripling around it um, and actually start fixing the problems. Yeah, all right. And that's, that's painting a picture of the current situation. And um, uh, Khamotso, I bring you into the conversation now. And I don't want to talk about the solution right now because that's where we headed. But I, I, I want to get from your perspective as well. I mean, you've listened to both Professor and Doctor speaking about the issues that the country is facing. It, it's not a surprise. We know we are here. In fact, we wake up to the reality every single day, many to not having water coming out of taps. The quality of the water is a problem. The infrastructure is failing us. You drive on the roads and you see water squirting all over the place, water leaks, wastage. The, the, the story goes on and on and on. And the problem is the warning signs have been there, but nothing's been done about it. So you're coming in from a different perspective, though. Um, and perhaps we can, we can see where you are in terms of the water supply and a breakdown thereof. Where are your views? So, no doubt there's a crisis, right? Um, and as the professor and the doctor pointed out, the issue with Gauteg in particular does not necessarily relate to scarcity of water. The issue relates to the infrastructure mm. in delivering the water. But I just want to highlight a few more things. Whenever we talk about water, we always tend to think about you know, our taps at home, which is very important. But you need to understand that you cannot mine without water. You cannot produce electricity without water. You cannot run a manufacturing operation without water. So, so the water crisis does not just affect you at home and your ability to show up at work nicely showered. It also eventually affects your ability to show up at work in the first place yeah. because work might it, not exist. It, exactly. <laughs> and it affects the fact that uh, a population, I mean, we, water is life. Yeah. You don't have water, 
there's no life. Uh, People uh, move towards water sources, and, and if this is failing us, we're in big trouble. Absolutely, and that's why I founded the BT Industrial Group, because one of the principles of founding the company, uh, particularly as a person that looks the way I do, was to say, how do we manifestly and meaningfully participate in the guts of the economy? And if you look at the developmental trajectory of Africa in general, uh, you will see that we still need what I would call the building blocks of industry. Remember, Rome was home to a million citizens mm. 2,000 years ago because they had the aqueducts and aqueducts were working. Fresh water was coming in and sewage was coming out. And many historians argue that part of the destruction of Rome related to the collapse of that water infrastructure. So our thinking is, how do we then address those developmental challenges that we have? What kind of technologies do we bring to bear? And how do we remove the full responsibility of the solution away from the public sector, away from government, and bring some of the solution scope to within the hands of business in addressing part of that problem? Are you talking kind of like a, we saw the electricity crisis, we saw what happened, so many businesses have taken their lives so offline put solar, put generators, put um, inverters and all those kind of things. Is that the kind of solution you're looking at, that business need to get involved and come to the party and sort the issue out for themselves? Is that the, the, the issue? Absolutely. Uh, so so may, maybe let me start at a high level. As a business, we are a manufacturer of piping and piping systems. We also make uh, water treatment plants uh, at a large scale at municipal level, but also at a modular scale you know, units that you can install in a retail shopping center, uh, for example. We've implemented about a million kilometers of pipeline across the continent, across Africa. So the distance from Earth to the moon is about 350,000 kilometers. So we've done about two and a half times the distance of, uh, to the moon in pipeline. So to do that, you need a technology that is fit for purpose for African conditions that will not result in premature burstings and leakages and so on, which is part of the problem that we're facing in Gauteng. About 41% of the water that's transmitted is lost through leakages in the piping. So that's the first way you address it. Choose a fit-for-purpose technology in building your infrastructure. But at a more granular level, what should business do? So we are doing a project now. Uh, for uh, old mutual property management at the zone in Rosebank. What we are doing is we are treating 23% uh, of the water that they withdraw from the system. About 75% of the water that a shopping center would, with, would withdraw is gray water. And we're treating 23% of the total, mm. not the whole 75%, uh, on, a, on a 50 cube system. So what that does is it allows them to withdraw 23% less water from the system, treat the water, and only top up. And that water is used for non-portable pur non purposes, which is irrigation, uh, uh, toilet flushing, and so on and so forth. But that, at a mm -hmm. macro level, when you blow it up to a national level uh, and you use uh, industry benchmarks, you realize that shopping centers in South Africa use about 10 million cubes of water per year. Mm -hmm. So if all shopping centers simply treated 25%, of the water that they withdraw, we would save uh, 2.5 million cubes of water. Okay. You, you could save up, you, you could treat 50% of that water, right. the and gray water, then pushing it up to about 5 million. Recycling water, okay, there's a, a solution there. I, I wanna get the, the experts' opinions on this as well. In a, in a short while, we need to, of course, take a break, and then I'll come back and I'm, I'm going to get some more views on the water situation and also uh, let uh, Dr. Turton and uh, the professor weigh in on this. So do stay with us, this conversation continues. Right, let's continue this conversation about uh, the water problems and issues and solutions that South Africa needs to find to get the situation under control and ensure that the crisis we find ourselves in doesn't escalate to something that is something we cannot repair. So let's bring um, our guests that are joining us virtually back into the conversation now. Um, Professor Anya Duplessis, I'm going to begin with you to, to perhaps talk to a solution that we did hear from Khomoto talking to what it is that you know, his company does and 
that business need to step up to the plate as well. They need to assist. It cannot be uh, reliant entirely on government, which we've realized that we can't. But, you know, is this enough? What more do we need? Well, um, first of all, you need political will at the end of the day. Um, you know, the recycling of wastewater to, to be of a suitable quality for either drinking or industrial purposes is nothing new. Uh, this technology has been available for, for many years. So I, I think the, the problem that we are having is, is to say, yes, we have the solutions like that. There are other solutions as well. But once again, it require, it's going to require a lot of private investment, um, according to, to government now turning to the private sector to say that they need to jump in and assist um, dysfunctional municipalities. But um, I feel that you know, we can't just keep on passing the buck. And um, so if it is a case of private sector having to intervene and actually fix the problem, there has to be some accountability on municipal level. Um, I read this morning that a municipality in Pumalanga has been fined 200 million rand um, because they have been dumping raw sewage directly into to rivers. So I think that's obviously a solution that we, we know of and that we can implement. But what we've seen the problem is, is that unfortunately, we're sitting with uh, an issue of a lack of political will. Yes, it's gaining momentum now. But um, I would like to see words transpire in actual action. Yeah, and, and, and this, is, this is something that, you know, that, that infuriates one to hear what you're saying. And yes, you get fined for that, but I mean, these are people's lives that you're dealing with where you're polluting the water, the water supply is unable to be used, and then what do you do? Um, Dr. Turton, we come, we come to you now. And you know, obviously, we, we, we get a response from Professor about the solution that's on the table. It's nothing new, but it is being implemented and it is, be, it is working currently. But it's that political will that's, that's missing. And it is going to cost the country a lot of money to, to rectify this. So do you want to weigh in on, on some of these solutions? Yes. So, so firstly, I'd like to commend Kamatsu for, for his vision and, and his, his leadership, because uh, what he's doing is really uh, transitioning to what I call a dual stream reticulation economy. I, I did a, a presentation to SAPO, the South African Property Owners Association, in about 2018, 2019, where I spoke about just exactly this. And those are the people that own all of the commercial real estate, so all of the big shopping centers and all of the office blocks and whatever, they, they were represented by SAPO. And I spoke about exactly this, about this, so uh, what, I, what I call a du dual stream reticulation system where water of different quality and, and different price is available for different purposes. So, so at that point in time, um, I was uh, talking with, with Bidvest and advising Bidvest to get into that space, and it looks like Komotsu has beaten them to it, and that's, uh, that, that's, that's all strength to his arm. Um, just, just to give an indication of the size of the recycling and recovering economy, it's, uh, it's about 25 billion cubic meters per annum. That's the size of the economy, of the, of the, of the, the economy for new water, or the size of the market for new water. So that's, that's the size that Komotsu's company can potentially grow into, 25 billion cubic meters. Now, how big is that? Uh, that is 60% of the total volume of all of our dams in South Africa that has to be provided in approximately the next 10 to 10 to 20 years. That's how much we have to recycle. And in fact, if we take every single unit of water in South Africa that we have at the moment, and we recycle it 1.6 times. In other words, we use it once, we're already using it once, we only have to use it another 0.6 of a time more. Then we can have full employment uh, you know, by, by 2035. So uh, uh, the, the, the point I'd like to make is that, as we saw with the Eskom uh, crisis, <clears throat> the private sector rose to the occasion, the private sector resolved the problem, they made themselves independent of a uh, of a, uh, a centrally supplied uh, uh, resource, and uh, Eskom essentially became uh, irrelevant over time. Not totally irrelevant, but but increasingly irrelevant. Many shopping centres today no longer need Eskom you know, to, to survive. And you, you're going to start seeing the same in the water sector, where independent service providers, uh, ISPs, are going to start coming to the fore. This is being legislated at the moment. It's uh, you know it's it's, it's coming. I've got, a, I've got a meeting after this one now with very senior executives within, uh, in, within Water Affairs uh, discussing different elements of, of this very single process, same process. The, the amount of uh, capital that is needed to, to uh, repair what's broken in the water sector, 
The number that I work on is the, is the number from the SA Business Water Chamber, which I'm a member, and that is one trillion South African rand. But recently I heard that the president used the number of three trillion, so three times that amount. So I don't know why, where he got that number from. But nonetheless, it, we're talking certainly in, uh, in, in, in the trillions. Uh, and, and that money is not available from the fiscus because the economy is uh, tanked and uh, the, the taxes going to government are, are increasingly no longer able to sustain uh, the, uh, just the salaries of civil servants. So this is the crisis we're moving towards, and, and all of this is driving the private sector into becoming relatively self-sufficient. You can't quite become as, as self-sufficient with water as you can with energy for various reasons, but certainly uh, the, the notion of a dual-stream reticulation system is here to stay. And more importantly, the concept of public-private partnerships, yeah. PPPs, are here to stay. And I'd just like to say one more thing. Uh, I'm busy working uh, in, a, in an international group of people. I, I do a lot of work in the Middle East, and we are working uh, on the, the notion of establishing a market uh, that, uh, that w in which you can trade water credits. So, for example, for every improvement uh, that, uh, that can be made, let's just take an example of a wastewater works that's currently dumping untreated sewage into a river. We, we can measure that uh, uh, with the Internet of Things. And any improvement that they make uh, uh, above a certain uh, defined threshold, they can earn a credit. And that credit can, in fact, become... The, uh, the cash flow needed to sustain these public-private partnerships afterwards. So th this is a very, very exciting space for innovation, for, for alternative fi fi financial instruments, and uh, for the uh, emergence of technology. And just one more thing I'd like to say, there's no shortage of technology out there. There are hundreds of technologies, and the solution, uh, uh, the solution uh, makers are going to be the people <clears throat> that can integrate different technologies into uh, into a package of solutions over time. Yeah. So, Humozo, 100%, you're in the right place without any question of doubt. Fantastic. I mean, you know, Humozo, obviously, the, the, it, as we've heard, I mean, these are, this is the solution. This is what we're looking for. But um, the, the, the private sector, again, stepping up to do the job of government? Is that uh, one way we could look at it? No. Uh, or uh, is this uh, their responsibility? Okay, so <laughs> Government's responsibility. I mean, no, private sector's responsibility. I'm a business person, so I wake up in the morning and I solve problems. So what I'm saying is this, water is non-renewable, -re right? So the responsible thing for, for business to do anyway is to recycle water. It's like recycling plastic and paper. Mm -hmm. You have to do it anyway, so it's yeah. a good thing to do. Right, so that's the first and thing. And your hand's being forced now, because when you see a crisis, you have to do this. You, you have to this act. Is, are we talking private sector? Private business? sector, yeah. yes. So, so I'm saying I agree that there are big problems that need between one and three trillion rand, as the good professor is saying, to fix. You know, if, if I think of three trillion, I'm going to stay in bed the whole day and cry, right? Yeah. But practically, what do we have to do? We have to recycle water. <clears throat> as a basic principle. Now, if you look at the investment side of that equation, you get a 16 times money back as a business from your investment. Just by the way, my plant, when I bought, uh, when we bought the land where we've built our factory, uh, we were told that there would be sufficient water. We need about 180 cubes of water to run our manufacturing process. It wasn't there. So we had to dig a borehole and we had to treat our own water and recycle it on site as a business and that has made us much more sustainable our bill has reduced by about 75 uh, percent our water bill now remember you pay for the water that you withdraw but you also pay for the sewage that you use yeah. now when you cut on your withdrawal you also cut on your sewage so you save on those two legs as a business so the investment case is very very, very strong, strong. Very so that's strong. the first point and then the second point relates to uh, the water that you consume as a business. Uh, if we look at the numbers that we see, there are 41% uh, leaks in the system, right? Of which about 33% is physical leaks. It's not just one way, by the way. It's the water that's coming in, and again, it's the water that's going out. So what it means, for example, if you look at all retail shopping malls treating their gray water, uh, which their total withdrawal is about 10 million cubes a year, it means you actually have to pump 16 million for them to consume 10 million mm. and then flush it down the toilet. Okay. You understand? Yeah. So yeah. The, if the net effect of recycling on site is that you save for your site, but you also save on whatever would have been lost in pumping the water 
to you. And then what so it the does... the population is, right. is, is benefiting from this as well. Very quickly, we've only got five minutes. I just want to get a closure. So, so, so very quickly, when business does that, the balance of the infrastructure can be used to support the indigent. And suddenly the number is no longer three trillion. Maybe it's less than a trillion that government now has to focus on yeah. indigents. If business because business would have this. made it. No. If business could afford it. We'll make our, our returns. Yeah, yeah, yes. ab absolutely. But businesses are, are struggling at the moment. So I agree with you. Business need to do this. But um, doctor, I, 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 let me sort of start wrapping things up on, on, on this side as well. Um, you know, the, the, the warnings have been there. We know this. I've mentioned this uh, numerous times. But the biggest warning of all is, is perhaps a, 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 a thing that's come through that researchers are estimating that by 2025, that's next year, a few months away, we're going to face water scarcity. What are the consequences of water scarcity? Um, sorry, let me, let, me, let me add this one. This is for Professor Duplessis. Apologies, I'll, I'll come to you now, Dr. Turton. Professor. So um, to say that we're going to reach water scarcity at 2025, if we look at the research that's been done, um, it already said that in uh, 2020, 2017, thereabouts, we already uh, achieved water deficit of 17%. So to say that, you know, we will be okay and we're not experiencing water scarcity until 2025, we are unfortunately already in some parts of the country um, has experienced increased water stress. So, so that's the one thing. Um, and then just a comment on the solution that has been proposed. It's a very good solution. However, if you, you have to speak to the public as well, at the end of the day, there's going to be uh, adaptions are going to be required, like people did um, in terms of electricity with the blackouts. But we need to remember that water is an economic enabler, so all parties need to be involved, um, and we need to put solutions in context-specific scenarios. So one solution won't um, meet all. Yeah, and that's, and that's the reality. Prof, thanks very much. Um, Dr. Turton, Platinum City, we just went there in Rustenburg. We saw people that live there turning a tap on, not a drop coming out of it. In fact, not a drop has come out of it for five years. We had people here in the city of Johannesburg for two weeks and more, not a drop of water coming their way. And the situation's getting worse. We're seeing now the Lesotho Highlands project is going to be a big shutdown coming in October, and they're saying it's going to last uh, for a few months. However, this already in itself is delayed by nine years. We're worried. South Africa are worried. Are we warranted to be this worried? And is this a, a big failure on government's part? Look, it's uh, without any question of doubt, it's a failure. <clears throat> is it helpful to point a finger of blame at government? It makes us feel good, but it doesn't really solve the, 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 the problem. I think what we've got to do is we've got to start thinking about, uh, about our own independence as citizens. Uh, we are not dependent on government for everything. Government uh, uh, can only do two things. They can only incentivize uh, in good behavior, and they can use a big stick to punish bad behavior. That's all a government can really do. Government can't actually solve these problems. <clears throat> it's the private sector that, uh, that, that always comes uh, forward. And I'm very, very encouraged by the fact that the current leadership uh, in water affairs, the, the, the minister and the DG, uh, they're a powerful team. I, I, I'm working closely with them. They really are, they, they, they really are doing amazing things out there. And uh, uh, I give them my full support because they fully recognize the fact that they've dropped the ball and they've now got to start doing, doing the right thing. I just want to say one more thing, and that is that it doesn't help, in my view, to go and, uh, and, and sue a municipality or, or charge them 200 million rand, because all they do is use taxpayers' money to pay that fine. That's a double whammy. That's not the solution. Uh, we believe that this water credit situation that we're talking about, this water credit instrument that we're talking about, uh, 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 dramatically empowers uh, the, uh, the, the regulator by giving them additional uh, incentives on the positive side, on the carrot side, rather than on the stick side. Okay. So we believe that this is going to be a way forward in, in, a, in this whole public-private partnership role. And I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the outcome. All right. Do thank you very, very much, Dr. Anthony Turton, talking to us mm -hmm. there. Wrapping it all up. Komoto, good luck. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your idea with us. And that certainly is something that we're hearing business 
have to do. It's, it, it's, it, it's not even a, a thing you should be thinking of. It's a thing that you either have done or need to do. Komotso Lekola, the founder and group managing director of BT Industrial, as you know, Professor Anya Duplessis, uh, an associate prof of water management expert at UNISA and a uh, friend of the show as well, Dr. Anthony Turton, a water expert from the University of the Free State Center for Environmental Management, discussing the future of water in South Africa, the situation, but solutions more importantly.